Okay, we're resuming. We are resuming. Here we go. Everybody back? Mm. Okay, good. Right, Christopher. Okay, Lisa. All right. Good enough. Let's go. Let's go continue. Okay, so that was that. <laughs> okay, so that was the uh, session hijacking at layer five. Okay. Uh, let me clear my glasses here. Hang on. Okay, okay. So let's move forward. Hi, Derry. Okay, so we are just moving forward. Okay. Let's go to uh, secure communications. Okay, secure communications. So authentication protocols, PAP and CHAP. Um, uh, PAP and CHAP, I'm not sure if you recall, but this is when we uh, we used to connect to, uh, I'm sure it's still used, but uh, what was often used was when we connect to the ISP using a modem, right, setting up a PPP, remember, right, point-to-point -point protocol, and then they'll, you have to choose how you authenticate. Uh, do, do you want to use a PAP or CHAP? In, in both, you set the username and password so that the, the ISP can verify that you are, you're the proper customer, uh, and then you move forward from there. And which one, for those of you that remember, which one was considered more secure, PAP or CHAP? Don't remember? Okay. Um, 1001, 1002, 1003. CHAP. Okay. Um, because CHAP uh, is a challenge, uh, and they, they send a challenge back from the server, and you're supposed to uh, respond that back, and, and you know it will ask for like password, uh, and you send the password back a hash in the hash format. Whereas PAP, you send the username and password in a clear. So there you go. Old 802.1x uh, in EEP. 802.1x is what's called a port-based network access control, uh, and uh, so it's it's a port, you know, just like a uh, like a uh, switch port. Okay. Uh, EEP extensible authentication protocol. It's part of you know 802.1x, and it is an authentication framework. Right? Authentication, username and password. Right, and in fact. When, way back when, when I was uh, pricing these things out, it was Alcatel. And if you remember Alcatel, uh, Alcatel um, X. See, it um, Alcatel has um, a switch uh, that used to have a switch that was uh, had a it'll do that one X on each of the ports. <coughs> so, although we didn't get the buy because it was so expensive. Um, uh, what, I, what I understood the function to be is that when someone connects to that switch, it's going to ask for the authentication. And if you can't return proper username and password, <coughs> you would be denied access. And denied access means that you are isolated into this segment that you can't do much with. Uh, maybe it'll let you, maybe it's, it'll be a guest uh, segment so that you can access the internet, but that's about it. You won't be able to access the, uh, the internal, uh, the intranet. And on top of that, if you were to say, you know, okay, username and password, good, you know, you, you, you gain access, then they'll check uh, to make sure that you have the latest and greatest, uh, you know, antivirus uh, pattern file. If you don't, you have to update it, then you get access, right? So you can put all sorts of authentication or checks with these 802.1x's. But nowadays, 802.1x is often used on the wireless, more on wireless, I think, than wired uh, networks. So it is layer two, so it is port based, right? Like a switch. That's what. That's how it works. And in fact, the authentication piece is you for that particular switch, the Alcatel switch that I was talking about. Uh, you can connect uh, a AAA device. So AAA is right authentication, authorization, accounting. So anything that did those three will be a AAA device. And uh, uh, the quick and easy one to integrate with those switches was something called Radius. Right, radius. So radius is a uh, is a server uh, that would do AAA authentication, authorization, and accounting. So there you go.
part of the wireless. Uh, client's called the supplicant, server's called the authenticator. That's basically what it's called. Um, for different types of EAPs, extensible authentication protocol, uh, you have all the flavors are LEAP, EAP TLS, EAP TTLS, and PEEP. So let's take a look at EAPs. Okay? So LEAP is a lightweight extensible authentication protocol. It is Cisco proprietary. It does have flaws. It was one of the earlier ones. Uh, so people don't use it anymore, I hope. And EAP TLS is a transport layer security EAP. What does it do? It uses PKI. Hey, look, it's, it's TLS. Um, so it will authenticate the client and the server using certificates. In the example that we did on the TLS on the first day, we used these uh, server certificates, didn't we? And the server certificates serve to prove right, the authenticity of source uh, about the server. In this case, this requires also the user to have a certificate. Okay? So because the user has a certificate, server is able to authenticate the user in this case. Okay? Uh, it does use a TLS channel. The book states that it's complex due to the fact that you have to set up the certificates on both sides. I, I, I don't think complex is the word for it. I think it's a more tedious, <laughs> right, because you have more things to, to do. So I'm not exactly sure if it's complex or not. EAP TTLS is EAP tunneled transport layer security. So there is no need for the client side certificate in this case, only the server side. So it's relatively easier to deploy. Okay. PEEP, protected EAP. It is a concoction of Cisco plus Microsoft plus RSA. It is very similar to EAP TTLS. There you go. So these are all different types of um, uh, EAPs. VPN. We spoke a little bit about a VPN, remember? We talk, when we talk about the IPsec, right? And we talked about point-to-point VPN. -point, uh, so point-to-point -point protocol, layer two, confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. Okay. IPsec, we talked about it yesterday is layer three, okay? Confidentiality, integrity, and authentic, uh, authentication if, if you use both the ESP, right? So the ESP is the one that gives you confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. AH only gives you integrity and authentication. That's it, okay? Uh, SSL and TLS, right? Uh, designed to protect HTTP initially. Uh, TLS is equivalent to SSL version 3.1. Currently, TLS 1.2 uh, is being um, recommended for use. And there's been an official word out to stating that not to use SSL version 3.0 anymore. In fact, this. So this is called the RFC, Request for Comment. So it's the closest, closest thing to a, a, a guidance on the, um, uh, like a notice on the internet. So it says they're deprecating Secure Socket Layer version 3.0. Okay, so it says that it is not sufficiently secure. It hasn't been, uh, you know, sufficiently secure, but it's been patched and patched and patched, and then they say, look, it's, it's unpatchable now. It's, it's just, fundamentally, it's flawed. So we can't use it. And what they're telling you is that Transport Layer Security TLS 1.2 is considered more secure and capable protocol. Right? And in fact, I believe in, in, in here they talk about what, what is the difference between TLS and SSL. So if you're interested in that, you know, please take a look at it. There's like you know, five, five or six things that are different. Okay. Alrighty. Moving back. VPN can tunnel other protocols. And so here's, here's one thing. Let me go back into the whiteboard about tunneling in general. Okay. You can tunnel using many things. You can tunnel things using HTTP. You can tunnel using SSH. You can tunnel using SSL. You can tunnel in anything. Um, but normally, you know, why do we tunnel? Can you, can, you, can you tell me why? Why do we even do this thing called tunneling? Can somebody tell me the reason behind tunneling?
create a secure connection between two points, set up a secure channel from one point to another. Well, you're, you're actually answering the question of what is SSL or what is TLS. You haven't told me why people tunnel. Okay, very good. Okay, Terry, so I'll, I'll take that. Um, so more generic uh, would be the reason people tunnel usually is because um, one, as Terry mentioned, let's say something like FTP. So hey, FTP doesn't offer right, uh, security because people can see everything. Well, but we, we still want to use FTP, but is there anything we can do about it? Well, you can tunnel it, right? So of course, the, t the protocol that you want to tunnel through um, uh, would be something that has, you know, encryption as part of it. <clears throat> Why would anybody tunnel anything over HTTP? If it's not secure. Why would people tunnel using HTTP? Or did you know that people actually do tunneling using HTTP? Yes. No, port 80, HTTP. Uh -huh. Security, okay. To work with, to work in IPv4 with IPv6. Chris, what, what does that mean? You would tunnel over port 80 if my SD only allowed port 80 traffic. Yeah, see, I would do that too, Terry. This. Your application is IPv6, but you need to access a VLAN that only supports IPv4. I need a tunnel to the application traffic. Using IPv6, you need to access a VLAN that only supports IPv4. Okay? I need to tunnel to the application traffic. Okay. All right. Good enough. So, so you're doing... It's <laughs> yeah, Terry, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so what um, what Chris was mentioning is more of a how do you transition, right? So, this is one of the transitioning um, uh, scheme is you tunnel one uh, one protocol over another. Uh, so, if, if if people only understand IPv4, and in order to get through to the IPv6 application, if you have to go through an IPv4 network, you just go ahead and tunnel it through an IPv4 network. Is that what you mean, Christopher? Yeah, yeah, totally fine. So, um, Teredo, I'm not sure what that is, Terry. And I'm sure Japanese people pronounce that very differently, too. <laughs> what is Teredo? It almost sounds like my name. Microsoft used Teredo endpoints to tunnel IPv6 over. Oh, I see. So it is a, it is a transition uh, scheme, is that? Okay. Learning so many things, guys. Thank you so much. Um, Teredo tunneling. Oh, is that right? Teredo adapter? 
So I'm just looking at the Wikipedia now. In Community Teredo is a transition technology that, that gives full IPv6 connectivity for IPv6 cable hosts that are on the IPv4 internet, but have no native connection to an IPv6 network. Ah, very good. It can perform its function even behind the net. Well, that's nice. Teredo operates using a platform-independent tunneling protocol that provides IPv6 connectivity, encapsulating IPv6 datagram packets within IPv4 use datagram protocol. Oh, it's in the UDP. Nice. Well, I would imagine so, because it's UDP. Teredo is a temporary measure. Yeah. Wow, very interesting. Hey, thank you, Terry. Um, so hackers would use tunneling, uh, mainly for the reasons that, you know, what Terry just mentioned is, look, I only have port 80 open, but I want to get behind, you know, without, you know, um, I want to do something else. You know, but only port that I have available is port 80. So if you have a firewall, let's say you have a firewall that only allows port 80, okay? And you want to get behind the firewall, so here's the port 80 for the web server, okay? But let's say you, have, you know that there is an FTP server behind. It's just that you know, port 21 isn't open, right? And so, here's the attacker. Basically, the attacker, right, wants to be able to access, wants to access and attack FTP, okay? But there is no port 81, uh, 21 open, so he has to do something else to get there, okay? And for tunneling, you have to have two cooperating, you know, functions. So, for example, if you're doing HTTP, right, so here's the HTTP server, right, it's a server, and you have the client, okay, so this is uh, like the browser, but, you know, anything that, that works with port 80. So basically, it's, you know, going through, right? So I'm just going to draw, like, something that looks like a tunnel. But it, obviously, this is just a, just a session, right, for HTTP to port 80, but it goes through the firewall. But you actually have to have a scheme where something like your FTP client Right, can get to the FTP server. So the scheme is, there's got to be a way, and there will be something that's running here, that redirects this thing into port 80. Instead of going to 21, it goes to port 80. Okay, and then it travels across, and once it gets to the server, there's got to be a way for this thing to be redirected to the FTP server. Okay, so, so you have to have a scheme on both sides that pushes something into the tunnel and takes something out from the tunnel and redirects it or sends it to the proper service, right? So if a, if a hacker is going to do this, hacker actually has to set up, so there's got to be some kind of a uh, helper on the other side that sets this uh, tunnel scheme up or else it won't work. Just If you just have a web server, you, you can't just push through push things through to the web server hoping that it's going to pop out on the other side and go to where you want it to go, okay? So this tunnel could be HTTP, it could be SSL, it can be, you know, uh, SSH, any of these things. Now SSH is relatively easier to do a tunneling compared to others because with SSH, with a client and a server, it's actually made to tunnel. Uh, it's only a one-liner to do a tunneling uh, on the SSH side. So it's, it, if you have the SSH, but remember, SSH also takes a, a port, and it just really does depend upon your uh, administrator if the uh, SSH port right, uh, is open or not. So we're talking about, like, port 22. If that thing is open or not, if it's not open, then you're, you're out of luck, aren't you? All right, so that's the, the, uh, the reason why we tunnel. 
Uh, and of course, for the IPv4, IPv6 uh, transitional uh, tunneling is another scheme as well. Okay, very good. So let's go back to the presentation material. Okay, so we were talking about VPNs and we were talking about the tunneling. So the next thing is voice or IP, background information, um, voice over the network, packet switch benefits, lower cost resiliency. Uh, there's something called the real-time transfer protocol, RTP, uh, and it does streaming audio video. It, um, it, SIP is also necessary to, SIP makes a call. Uh, it looks just like HTTP. Uh, and you have the secure real-time transfer protocol. Uh, so for this one, you do have a secure voice over IP. It will do encrypt using AES and SHA-1 for integrity. Wireless plans, I'm just moving across. These are background information that, that you need to know. It's in your book, okay? Maximize throughput, minimize effective interference, okay? Uh, over a radio band such as 2.4 gigahertz, uh, you know, band. Different types of frequency hopping, okay? You basically need to know this. In fact, let me just go ahead and I'm not sure if I actually, let me, let me just see if I actually gave you the, nope, nope, right, let me just get this all, this all out. No, okay, so I haven't, I haven't modified this one, but <clears throat> let me just, before explaining all these things, let me just show you the 2.4 gigahertz uh, and 5 gigahertz. I'm not sure why all the, oh, so this is good. Okay. This is in the U.S. Um, oh, this is actually good. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the gigahertz, so these are the, the channels that people can use. In fact, I'm not sure if this is good. Let me see. I don't think this is. Hang on. There's a better one. <clears throat> the spectrum. Mm, here. Uh, Okay, so <coughs> okay, so this is the what is the difference between the two point four and five? Um, so the the two point four gigahertz uh, has these channels, but as you notice, you know one and two, three and four, they they overlap. So if they overlap, you know that you're going to have uh, consequences, overlapping signals. So for 2.4 gigahertz, although you have all these 11 channels, you only <coughs> we only use like three of them, three non-overlapping channels like one, six, and eleven. Okay, and the five gigahertz is a little bit different in that okay, see. Let me just show you, uh, 5 gigahertz, um, I, if I do that, I'm sure I'll get it. Oh, this might be good. Yeah, this looks good. Mm. Not exactly what I was looking for. Oh, here it is, right here, right here. Okay, why well, faster? This is good. So with a five gigahertz, um, the you have non-overlapping, uh, you have non-overlapping channels. So and you have much more of them. Okay, All right. So so these are the channels and the uh, Wi-Fi standards and the uh, let's see.
looking for something that actually has this information. I know some of them do. Nope, nope. I guess this is something I have to find for you uh, because I want I want actually for you to have a good feel of the frequency uh, types and the bandwidth. So uh, let me see Wi-Fi. Just a little bit. So F H S S. Oh yeah, this is good. Yeah. Oh, this is perfect. In fact, I think I'll use this one. Um, okay. If you take a look at this. Okay. This is actually very nice. Uh, so it's Wi-Fi variants uh, and. You see the, the year that they came out, 802.11, um, but the ones that we're using right now is you know, 802.11 Bravo and Alpha. The Bravo came out first uh, before Alpha. And notice that the bandwidth that they use, uh, 2.4 and 5. And the bandwidth, and look at the, the codification. So see, that's where you have these all different types of uh, how they send information over a channel. So, so take for example something like uh, 802.11 Bravo 2.4 DSSS, right? So, so then look at the DSSS direct sequence spread spectrum uses the entire channel at once by spreading the signal throughout the channel, right? Is uses the entire channel at once. So that's how the um, 802.11 Alpha does it, but with the um, I'm sorry, Bravo does it, but the 11 alpha uses the, the OFDM, <coughs> which is the orthogonal frequency division multiplexing uh, simultaneous transmission using multiple independent wireless frequencies. Simultaneous transmission using multiple independent wireless frequencies. Okay, so that's how these things work. And the slide that I have here, I think the one that I'm, I have here is much better. Um, and so you see. For example, the Bravo has the maximum data rate of 11 megabits, uh, whereas the Alpha uh, uses uh, has like 54 megabits. But there's a there's a major problem with Alpha uh, because it uses the five uh, gigahertz band. That there's a lot of issues with the interferences. So if you have like a door, the wall, you know, any kind of big object, uh, the signal usually doesn't go uh, through it. Uh, so you it stops it, and and it's it's more um, prevalent to have these things interrupted or you know obstructed. So 2.4 gigahertz is much better when it comes to that. So the next one that came out was the 802.11 Golf G right in 2003. And this one stays at the 2.4 right gigahertz because of the you know the better uh, you know behavior yeah. lower the frequency for the transmission the better it penetrates and goes long distances yeah thank you Terry why is that Terry see I've I've never known see, I'm not a that's not a strong suit for me oh wow so it goes right through that's kind of scary we are all made of spaces. Pass it through concrete. Wow. <laughs> it is just amazing to me, all these technologies. Especially the physical world, which I know not too I don't really know too much about. when it comes to frequencies. Ten miles, line of sight. So it doesn't go through anything, right? Oh, it goes through the bulkhead steel? But you get more bandwidth. Yeah, that's what you saw, right? You get more bandwidth because of you have, you know, these uh, non-interfering 
um, channels, whereas on the low one you get interference, uh, especially like with uh, you know two point or the two point four. You have other stuff, right? So bandwidth versus distance and penetration. Yeah, with two point four though, all the other thing like my toasters, my fridge, whatever, they all use that bandwidth too, right? So that isn't that the reason why we have a lot of issues with uh, the lower bandwidth. Uh, I mean, uh, lower uh, the band. Microwave covers a huge band. Okay, yeah. So there you go. So with the golf, you know, you stay with the the lower, so uh, with 2.4, and you get the the data rate of uh, 54 megabits per second. And I would imagine, and you, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Terry. It's because it's starting to use a different uh, codification. Oh, is that right? Okay, okay, very nice. And then you have the 802.11 November. Uh, you you can use both uh, 2.4 or 5. Uh, and so there you go. And it uses OFDM. This is actually a very nice slide. And on 2014, 802.11 um, AC. So this is the one that you know the MIMO that you have like a bunch of like I think on mine had like three um, three antennas on the access points. Yeah, multiple bands used. Very nice. Hey, thank you. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so I'm I'm going to change that by the way because I like the one that we just found. I think that's nice. So while this continued, um, now come the security part, the web wired equivalent uh, privacy, and the it was an attempt at the wireless security, so uh, encryption. Okay, um, but it failed and it. I think I, I think I mentioned it right. So it was a flawed implementation of RC4, uh, which had the um, the repeating uh, IVs. And you see the importance of IV, as we discussed on the five modes uh, of uh, block in, uh, block ciphers. Okay, it'll do that 11i. So people came up with the uh, the stopgap measure, and it was called you know the um, uh, WPA. But WPA fixed the IV problem. But it's the 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 ciphers were still weak, so WPA2 came came around, and of course that's what we're using right now. And WPA2 uses the AES encryption, so it's much more you know stringent when it comes to encryption. Um, it does 802.11i has a pluggable authentication module, so you can actually you know plug and play uh, ciphers, okay, if you want to. Bluetooth uh, is also wireless, and we talked about that, so 2.4 gigahertz, okay? okay. RFIDs, uh, radio frequency identification, little tags that you find uh, that you put in, wireless readable tags. Um, there are three different types, so you have the active, you have the semi-passive, and you have the passive, okay? And one of the, the uh, it, it does have an antenna uh, inside these RFIDs, and the passive ones, I'm sure you know, you've probably seen, uh, like in stores that has a little RFID tags. And as you go through the reader, uh, you have to be close enough so that the the electrical field creates the um, the 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 the, the, <laughs> the reader signal. What reader's power actually creates the signals, in the, the electrical field within the the uh, the passive. RFID and is able to communicate with uh, the reader. Uh, active one has its own uh, uh, battery power, so it can broadcast a signal in that way. One of the well, there's some problems with the RFIDs, especially the passive ones, is that you have to be pretty close to the reader uh, for the the RFID to actually get activated and the information to be read. Um, there's some things like you can't make it wet, you can't put it on steel surfaces and, and things because of the antenna that's inside uh, the RFID. Uh, but uh, there are some newer technologies coming in RFID where you can put these things, you know, on the wet uh, wet metal surface. So you know things are things are changing in the RFID world as well. Okay. Remote access. There are various ways that we do remote accesses. Remote desktop console access, uh, VNC. If you're a Unix fan, you're probably doing VNC. If you're a Windows fan, you're probably doing RDPs. Um, desktop and application virtualizations. Okay, uh, so you could do a virtual desktop infrastructure. I mean, it was you know not 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 back so many years ago. Uh, in order to have VDIs, you probably had to have a whole host of you know techie people supporting you. But I actually have a VDI from uh, uh, Amazon Web Services, 
I got one in Virginia's um, uh, data center, and all I did was just pick a service and say, I want one. And now I have uh, Windows 7, I think, VDI. Uh, so things are getting, things are really getting simpler. Instant messaging, uh, remote meeting technologies is the kind that we're using right now. Uh, like link, connections use our uh, DSLs, cable modems, right? So these are the technologies, remote access technologies. And I have this VNC example here. This is, this, you don't need to know at this level, right? Um, but just know that the VNC, Uses port 5900, 5901, 5902. You can you can start setting things up in the 5900s. And notice that the the computer on the right is accessing the computer on the left. Okay, so you're getting a um, you know the the virtual desktop inside. And the reason why I have this is because 5900s usually aren't open uh, on the firewalls. So if that's the case, you have to tunnel. And the typical way to tunnel is by using an SSH. So uh, you tunnel uh, SSH by, you say, you have a VNC client. And if you, if you look at, let me see, I know it's very small. In fact, let's see if I can make this thing bigger. No, it's not going to make it bigger. Sorry, you have to look at your, your um, uh, handout on this. But the command to do this is very simple. Uh, and it's right under where it says VNC access through firewall using SSH tunnel. There's a command line. It says SSH VNC user at, you know, IP address minus big R, P900, and then, you know, you do the, the opposite. So, so that's, it's just a one-liner. Uh, this, this is the part that's showing you that with an SSH you could do a, a tunneling very easily. Okay. But recently, because people use SSH, right, to do this kind of stuff, accessing something that's pretty sensitive in the inside, you know, the hackers have been looking for SSHs and trying to hack into SSHs, right? Okay, so, so there you go. We do have to be careful. Uh, in fact, was it the, you know what, let me see, um, what was it? I think it was SSH I think it was a Chinese company. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to recall. This was one of the, the vulnerabilities that were reported um, in, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. I, I'm, I'm looking at China because supposedly a, uh, a Chinese company produced a, a device that had an SSH, uh, and uh, it was, a lot of companies were using it. It was white labeling it. So it, it was coming under a whole bunch of different names, but they all had the same SSH vulnerability. So people are trying to people are looking for that particular device and the SSH and trying to break into it. That's what I recall. Uh, so, anyhow. Uh, same thing, the port 3389, <laughs> very unusual port. Right? That is, it's not one of these ports that you know you expect. Uh, so, uh, you would probably tunnel this as well. Okay. EDIs, right, just informational. Uh, application virtualization, I actually want to kind of stop here and kind of look at this, uh, is, in fact, I think after we're finished with this, uh, we'll go to lunch, okay? So the application virtualization, if you take a look at this thing, this kind of looks like, doesn't it, it kind of looks like the container that we, talk, we were talking about, doesn't it? Sort of? Okay? Because you have the operating system. Right. Well, it does kind of look like maybe, you know, type 1 virtualization perhaps, right? But it's a, it's a little different because there is no guest operating system inside that dotted thing where you have, you have the virtual application, okay? So the virtual ap application is used in this way. Let's say you are a diehard, you know, uh, PowerPoint user that you love your previous version of the, of the PowerPoint that you're using, let's say, on, I don't know, Windows 7 or something, okay? And and then, 
when it up when the Windows updated to uh, Windows 10, you said it came with a whole new look and feel of the PowerPoint. Okay, and you said I don't like this. Right? I want to use the other one, but because your work demands that you have to be able to use the new version as well, you said, well, is there any way that I can install two like both? And the quick answer is, well, it's going to be pretty difficult to do so because the PowerPoints probably share a same DLL that uh, the name is the same, but the the content of it has been updated and maybe even like not compatible. So this this happens. Let's say you install the you know Windows 10 version of the PowerPoint, okay, uh, and then you try to reinstall Windows you know 7 version of the PowerPoint, and it's, it's going to ask you. It's going to give a pop up that says you have a new version of DLL installed. Would you like to overwrite? Right? You've probably seen those kinds of messages. <clears throat> and if you say yes, chances are your Windows 10 version of the PowerPoint is not going to work. Okay, um, so so because it shares that DLL in common. Well, in order to overcome that problem, you would virtualize right your Windows 7 version of the PowerPoint. Okay, so that those DLL conflicts do not exist. The DLL conflict is resolved because that the older DLL is within the virtual application environment. And the, on the right hand side, the PowerPoint that is the, uses the newest and greatest just go ahead and uses what's available on the operating system, which is the newest. Okay, so that's that's how the now you have a, a happy environment where you have both Windows 7 version and Vin, Windows 10 version working. Okay, that would be the example of how you would use application virtualization. Okay, but as you saw already, you have the Type 1 and Type 2 virtualization. You have containers. You know, you've got all kinds of virtualization going on. All right, any questions on this part? Okay. So when we come back, uh, we will be going into network attacks. All right. So if there are no questions, let's go ahead and take a, an, an hour break for lunch. And when we come back, we'll just continue on. All right. Please have a, a very nice lunch, and I'll see you back in one hour. Thank you.